स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम Dear friends, welcome back to the Bhagavad Gita discourse. We had had an absence for a few weeks, and before I close the study of the third chapter, I did request you to revise the study. so that the continuity of the study of the fourth chapter is justified and is rational as you all know the bhagavad gita has 18 different chapters teaching of each chapter is related to the subsequent chapter and the last chapter the 18th is a summary or summation of the whole heap or basket full of wisdom that is transpiring through these chapters so firstly when we move from one chapter to the other the first preliminary requirement is we should try to find out what is the continuity of the thought processes that are being generated from chapter to chapter now we have studied the first three chapters now what is it all about please don't think of high spiritual things with mystical values beyond our common sense please disabuse yourself with such ideas the scriptures are there to give us a direction how to live our life in this world that's it how to live our life in this world for that matter the first analysis is how are we living now we start from there how we are living in this world as of today as of now from there how we can slowly and slowly based on the four faculties given to a human being rationality emotionality ingenuity and a rock solid will power based on these faculties the scriptures teaches us how to lead a life how to live a life when we are not battered by the vicissitudes and varieties of experience in our life so the first chapter tells us however educated however smart however wise we may be from the worldly and point worldly point of view that whole gamut of education is not sufficient there is an area where we are blind and we are being battered by that area but we refuse to learn our lessons from them and we say oh it happens it is so what is that while living in this world first and the foremost thing is 
we have to face that phenomena known as death. And if you are totally attached emotionally involved with that person who all of a sudden disappears, you are absolutely deep in sorrow. You do not know what to do. There is no corrective measure available to you to help you, to stand by you, to bring you out of the death of misery, depth of misery and sadness. It's happening every moment of our life, but we keep a blind eye to it. And we say, oh, it's nothing, this is what it is. Inevit inevitability of death is a fact of life. And that death causes us misery, misery agony, sadness. Or if he is my sworn enemy, a relief. I am a victim to these reactions, victim of these reactions. And I go through them. It hurts, it pains, it agonizes. But just because we do not know how to have a way out of it, we take it in our stride. And we again indulge with this world. This is how we live. Let me now go a little deeper in explaining so that I prepare a base for this study. What is life? I'll go back to Swami Shardanandaji's definition of life. A young Swami came from home, from an isolated surrounding. He came to this organization. This organization had at that time, say, 150 people, 150 persons coming from 100, 150 different families with different traditions, different beliefs, different way of life, and we are all living together. This new boy, he got totally lost, not knowing where his murins are. Swardhanandaji was his guru, his teacher. So he went to Shardhanandaji and with great puzzle in his mind and eyes, Sir, what is this life? I find no clue. I have nothing to catch upon. Everyone is speaking their own way. What is this life? Sharat Maharaj, his popular name, Sharadanandaji, understood the boy's situation and he said, you don't know what life is. Listen to me. Life is nothing else but an unending chain of experiences. Either they are good or they are bad or they are indifferent. Unending chain of experiences. Either they are enjoyable or deplorable or you are indifferent. The boy thought and said, that is true. I'm reacting to the world always, always. And while reacting, I'm going through my mood swings, either good or bad or indifferent. So he partially understood and he was going away. The teacher called him back because the advice was not complete. That is what an excellent teacher is. Calls him back. You are happy with the definition, but you don't know. You didn't ask me what is the purpose of life. 
So he felt a bit embarrassed. I'm giving you the details so that you can visualize and put yourself in the place of that young student. Yes, sir, what is the purpose of life? The purpose of life is to profit yourself from these experiences. Whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're indifferent, profit yourself. What is the profit factor? Prepare yourself to reach the ultimate goal. That is the profit that you get out of this world, living in this world. How to profit yourself in this world comes from the teachings of the scriptures. You have to live your life you can't run away from it. So be intelligent enough, be smart enough, be wise enough to profit yourself from these experiences so that you can reach the ultimate goal of life to be one with God. So dears, this is what we have to keep in mind. The words from a realized soul in answer to a totally perplexed young boy who wants to be one with God, but he is totally lost in this world. He has not learned that these experiences of the world, which makes me a victim of mood swings, this experience can teach me how to live in this world and be one with God. The scripture is that, that lesson, how to profit yourself from these experiences. So let me start from the beginning, the first chapter. It is known as, the chapter is known as Vishada Yoga a chapter describing the sorrow, the misery, the despondency of a human who is totally educated from the worldly point of view, but he has not educated himself to take life and see life in its totality and profit himself from that experience that he has not learned. That word in the Upanishadic studies we have seen, one is known as Aparavidya, the other is known as Paravidya. Let us refer to the Mundaka Upanishad that we are st studying in tandem. What does Upanishad say? Look, dear, there are two branches of knowledge. One branch of knowledge is to be in this world and qualify yourself or educate yourself in all branches of education appurtenant to this world and the mysteries of nature. And that education leads to mastery over the forces of nature and that having mastered that, that force of nature is utilized for human betterment, human comfort. That is what is known as civilization. Opera vidya. And there's another branch of knowledge that is supreme me, supreme knowledge. There's nothing beyond that. And what is the subject matter of that knowledge? Jaya, by means of which, tatakshanam adhigamnate. You slowly and slowly, in a process of evolution, gradually you be and become one with God. Adhipurvak Gamadhatu. That means 
the process of being and becoming natural process of evolution, you expedite it by your efforts and you call it a revolution. That knowledge is being given to you by the Gita chapter-wise. Thousand and one different ways. But all these different ways leads to the same goal. All the rivers of the world, they find their way out, they meander to landmass and ultimately either they merge with each other, but ultimately the mass of water reaches the ocean, loses its separate identity. 360 degrees of a circumference, 360 radii, they are different, but just because they are radius, that is, they emanate at a vertical manner, 90 degrees manner from the point in the circumference, all of them meet at the center. Center is the goal and 360 is a different number. That number can multiply by infinite. They reach the goal. The Gita will teach you that. The first chapter is Vishada Yoga. How graphically it has been mentioned? Bear with me, please. I may not start the fourth chapter today, but let me make the groundwork so that the fourth chapter, which is difficult to understand, but becomes easy for you. What is it? Arjuna was supposed to be the most enlightened, most accomplished, most educated in the disciplines of varieties of life, varieties of disciplines in life, and he was itching for a fight. Literally, he was itching for a fight because he knew his own might and main, and he knew he can win the war. So here is a man who is spoiling and itching to fight, to assert the, the family's right to the throne of India. Good enough. Sri Krishna is watching. He say nothing because a good teacher only teaches when the student is totally receptive. If he is not receptive, they don't speak. Let them gain lessons and experiences of life and let them be receptive, then it will be useful. Sri Krishna kept quiet. After all, he is God, God personate. He, is, he knows how to teach. When he teaches, when in the battlefield, Arjuna says with all his pride and vanity, his might and main, his so-called self-confidence, take me in front of the two side, the warriors, two groups of warriors, so that I can see for myself those so-called enemies of mine who have the temerity, the spleen, the cheek to raise an arm against me. Let me see them. He has crossed the limit of self-confidence. He has entered into the domain of arrogance, impertinence, as if he is a ruler of the universe. He is arrogating on to himself as is the Lord God of the universe. I would like to see who have that temerity, that cheek, that spleen to fight with me. That is how it starts. Kair maya sahaj yodhyabhyam asmin rana samuddhame 
I'm quoting this to justify myself, but don't think it is my wool-headed ideas. He says, come on, take my chariot in between the two fighting groups so that, so that I can see in a deep, scrutinized manner, nirikshe aham, those who are prepared to fight this war with me. And I'd like to see them. Kair maya sahajodhyam. Who are those people who, who has the temerity, the cheek and the spleen to raise a weapon against me? That was the time when Arjuna has crossed the humble line of self-confidence. By God's grace, I have this capacity. He says, no, I would like to see them and teach them a lesson of life. Sri Krishna, in a very masterly fashion, Pashyaitan, have a look. And while saying, have a look, Sri Krishna highlights the blood relationship and emotional relationship with Arjuna and multiples on the other side. Because they are collaterals, a blood relationship is there and over and above a stronger relationship is emotional relationship. And when he says Pashyaitan, with a little pinch as it were, Arjuna's eyes open and he started seeing Bhishma Pitamaha, the grandfather, the doting grandfather, and he was the fond grandson his teacher of weaponry, the art of warfare, Drona, art of statecraft, Kripa, and his all elders of the family, youngers of the family, brothers, nephews, so on, grandsons, and so on. Pashyaita. Lord God of the universe, Sri Krishna said, have a look. And immediately all his so-called valor, all his so-called might and main disappeared into thin air. He asked with bewilderment to a Krishna, how can I, Krishna, raise my bow and arrow, aiming at my beloved grandfather Bhishma? How can I? What do you expect me to do? Am I to kill Bhishma? Am I to kill the Drona, Kripacharya, and all my dear and near ones, so that I wade through the stream of blood to the throne and enjoy the throne of India. That is what you expect me to do. And as human as possible, he blames Sri Krishna. Oh, what mahapapam kurtum bevashitavayam. Oh, God, God, God. Thank God. I was on the verge of perpetrating the most heinous crime in life to kill my dear and near ones for the greed of my throne. A total somersault. And he tells Krishna by implication, what were you doing, my friend, philosopher and guide? You my friend and philosopher and guide, you are inducing me to start this warfare. It's the most heinous of the heinous sins that I can think of. And what were you doing? Thank God in the nick of the moment, I have stopped fighting. I don't desire to fight. But 
He is a Kshatriya. What is a Kshatriya? He is born, he is sworn in life to defend righteousness, justice, equity, fair play. That is what the Kshatriya is all about. He has forgotten all that. To slay, to kill, to defeat and wade through the bloodbath to my throne. The throne is absolutely what with blood. I don't want that throne. I would rather be a mendicant monk and leave the battlefield and go away to the hills and the dales and forests. I renounce everything. As if renunciation is so easy and this is what the concept of renunciation is. It is a misconception of renunciation. You are unable to face the call of duty and you are protecting yourself with high sounding philosophy of renunciation and you are running away from performing your duty and you want to stamp yourself as a great renunciator. You have renounced the throne of India and to be a begging mendicant monk is better than that. This is how the first chapter, the chapter known as Vishada Yoga, despair, despondency, sadness, all mixed up together is Vishada. Sorrow. Sorrow comes from misunderstanding, causes despair and despondency, it's all mixed up together. And ultimately, Arjuna takes a decision by himself and says, nothing for me, I am not fighting. Titi tushni na jose iti govindam tushni mahubhava. What does it say? Hey Govinda, hey Krishna, I am not going to fight. And he loses his bow, arrow and the bow stack and sits quiet, lamenting, depressed, despondent, totally saturated with sorrow. Why? Because he does not know what to do, what not to do. This is graphically explaining, though he was worldly wise, though he was enlightened, though he was educated, all those factors are there, but there is a lack of education because of which he has not been able to handle the situation where he finds himself to be. This dear is the essential teachings of the first chapter, creating a groundwork of Parabhidya. That is, there are challenging periods of human life. However equipped you may be from the worldly point of view, you do not know how to face it. The Gita will teach you how to face it. So thus we go to the second chapter. Second chapter is nomenclatured as Sankhya Yoga. And what this word Sankhya means, please don't make a mistake with the philosophy known as Sankhya philosophy, the six principal philosophies of India, Sankhya Yoga, Nyaya Vaisheshika, Uttar Mimamsa and Purva Mimamsa, Karmakanda and Vedanta. Six, Sankha is the oldest, known as Sankha Darshana. Here Sankha has a different meaning. The literal grammatical meaning of the word Sankha is 
संखीयते अनेन इति संख्य दैट कैपेसिटी व्हिच इक्विप्स यू विथ हेयर स्प्लिटिंग एनालिटिकल कैपेसिटी हेयर स्प्लिटिंग एनालिसिस and you have that capacity to analyze a situation in a hair splitting manner what does it mean there's not a nook or corner where you do not have an answer for this is what sankhya here means sankhyate you keep on breaking it into pieces as we see in english language a hair splitting arguments that is how the second chapter starts the second chapter starts by sri krishna <coughs> expressing not scolding expressing his utter surprise as if sri krishna is bewildered by what kutastwa kashmalamidam bishave samupasthitam anarj jushta masargam akirti kara arjuna arjuna kutastwa are arjuna where from have you acquired all this darkness of understanding this despair this non decisiveness and which will lead to total dismal failure in your life and you will be barred from having the life in heaven where from have you acquired that dirt arjuna i am bewildered i am surprised see what a wonderful teacher we have he doesn't rebuke he is putting words in such a manner that the student it's himself will be ashamed of his limitations and he would like to break his limitation and grow this is the secret of a good teacher and he is a teacher of the word god himself incarnate where from you acquired it and then he speaks to him in a language in the state in which arjuna is as of now arjuna you want to leave the battlefield where the battle has been proclaimed and you want to go and be a medigan monk well 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 you may justify yourself i may to some extent like what you are saying you want to become a monk to be one with god good enough but wait a while you belong to this society you belong to this world what will these opponents will think of you Sri Krishna is talking in a language of Arjuna in despair to all of us. What will this world think of you, Arjuna? Do you are nothing else but a paper tiger? You howl and growl and etc. etc. And when it comes to the crunch, you put your tail behind your legs. and you run away from the battlefield that will what people will think of you do you want to have that as a bargain because the little that i know shambhavitascha cha kirti maranat atirichate shri krishna says i have seen in this world sambhavitasya purushasya kirti a man of great standing and reputation whom the society acknowledges 
at the top of the world. A disrepute for that person is worse than death. That is why reputed people destroy themselves by suicide. Or being afraid of exposure, they kill themselves. That is Sambhavitasya Purusya Kirti, that the dis, disrepute, Akirti is disrepute, I'm sorry. Disrepute of a realized soul is worse than death. Would you like to face that? You will be living, mind you, you will be living up in the forest, but this will not leave your back. It will be on your shoulders. You will be, this will be your backpack on you all the time. The baggage that you will carry all the time. I ran away from the warfare. I am a Kshatriya. My duty was to defend righteousness, equity, justice, fair play. I have ran away. Would you be able to live with that or do you not think for yourself? He is not talking philosophy. Slowly and slowly and slowly, he is demolishing and destroying the negative thoughts, the erroneous ideas of misconception of Arjuna as to what he should do, what he should not do. He is creating an element of doubt in his mind preparing the ground for further wise advices. To cut it short, after a while, Arjuna tries to defend himself. But Sri Krishna listens to his defense and replies. Ultimately, he corners Arjuna in such a manner that Arjuna is absolutely helpless and he utters from the bottom of his heart, Karpanna dosha upahata svabhava prichamitam dharma sambhura cheta jasriya shat nishchitam bruhitan me shishya steham Sadhi Mang Tam Prapanna. One of the famous statements of Arjuna, which is applicable to the whole world, to the human society, till two people walk on this earth. They will face one day or other such a challenge of life that their competence will not be competent enough to solve this problem, apart from the problem of knowing how to be one with God. That problem has to be solved. So when he submits himself to Sri Krishna, saying that, look, I know I am an enlightened, educated, accomplished human being. I know that, sir. But I am finding myself in such a situation that I do not know how to utilize my faculties. They have all been deadened by this grief which comes from non-understanding the answer to the problems that I face. The problems are staring at my face and I have no answer for them. That is why I know I have my faculties, but I am a miser. Who is a miser? Who knows the amount of wealth he has, but he doesn't know how to utilize it, either for himself or for others. He's a miser. Karpanna dosha means the vice of being a miser. I am now almost like a miser. I am an enlightened, educated, accomplished human being, the best specimen of human being at that time society, 
and I find myself absolutely steeped in sorrow. Why? Because I have no answer to my problems. With this statement, Sri Krishna finds out Arjuna is now totally receptive, totally humble, totally modest. Humility and modesty is a sign of receptivity. And he opens up. He introduces first the concept of Karma Yoga. Yoga Karma Shu Kaushala. The expansive description of Karma Yoga is the third chapter which we have studied in great detail. And what is Karma Yoga the essence? How to live in this life without getting involved in this worldly affairs, your involvement with the Absolute, you live in this world and make use of the experiences of this world to reach that goal. Profit yourself from the experiences of this world. And life is nothing else but an endless chain of experiences. The two sentences is the essence of the second chapter given by Shami Shardanandaji. Or essential answer of your life. So he explains Karma Yoga in principle, in short. And the basic factor of Karma Yoga is you must be strong enough, use your rationality, your emotionality, your ingenuity and your willpower, all put together in an integrated manner and keep your sense organs in their proper place. And when they are in their proper place, the mind will automatically, will not be able to roam about. The doors and windows are shut. With that energy, you concentrate on the divine. And at the end of the second chapter, he speaks about the highest level of awareness that a human being can achieve before casting off this body. You are entitled to, that is your birthright. Jivana Mukti Shukha Prapti Hetabe Janmadharana. What does it mean? It means as we say to today, political freedom is an individual's birthright. Social freedom is an individual's birthright. We are very much aware of our birthright as far as the world is concerned. But being born a human, the best specimen of a biological creature, the most evolved of the biological creature, your primary birthright is to be one with God, to know thyself. So in the last section of the second chapter, Sri Krishna speaks to you about the signs and symptoms of a realized soul. Sthita Pragyasya Lakshana starting from Prajahati Jada Kaman Sarvan Partha Manogata. Starting from that shloka and the last shloka is Esha Brahmistiti Partham Nainam Prapya Vivunchati Sthitva Shyamanta Kalepi Brahma Nirvana Mrichati. This is the sign and symptom of a realized soul. Try to establish yourself in your lifetime. K 
keep on trying even the last moment of life when death is assailing you if you can have it you have had it let the body fall off after that you have merged with the divine now that divine appears to a human intellect in different forms a good friend is a divine grace on you a good acharya a teacher is a divine grace on you provided you know the art of profit yourself from that experience what is that profit let it always orient you towards the awareness of presence of the divine which is your true original nature and having known that see it everywhere drakshasi atmani athomai see him see me in yourself merge yourself with me and then you see me in the whole world all this has been defined and i have tried my very best to make it understandable to you this sthita pragyas lakshana when he defines defines it is known as sanyasa yoga gyana yoga sankhya yoga all these words are used they are almost with a little difference synonymous one highlighting the goal one highlighting the procedure to the goal upaya and upaya the cause and its effect that is something academic let us concentrate on the spiritual aspect he migrates to the third chapter karma yoga where he always says that karma yoga is a process of purification it is not the ultimate goal but it is the essential indispensable cause for the goal karma yoga leads to gyana yoga now here is a little i would say controversy amongst various thinkers various academicians various schools of thought in indian philosophy let us look at it from the saint of harmony from sri ramakrishna's point of view and his mouthpiece was swami vivekananda <clears throat> now to explain to you because we are educated in a manner this first this second this third this last class 1 class 2 class 3 you carry on class 12 is the end you qualify to enter the uni prior to that you don't qualify we are used to this thinking the teachers take advantage of that thinking he says you are today full 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 of worldly desires that is what you are today you have to get rid of this force of habit which has made a slave of you i expect this i like this i expect this i like and my expectations and likings motivate me to active to be active and i reach that goal i achieve my object from the worldly point of view that is how i am educated 
That is the way of life all of us understand. The scriptures are now taking that situation. Karma Yoga, you have now understood it thoroughly well, to get rid of any, any subtlest of the subtle attachment, involvement or desire. <clears throat> That is what you have to do with your rationality, with your ingenuity, with your emotionality, with your willpower. All four together. Your total personality is involved totally in this effort. That is the essential teaching of Karma Yoga. Only one thing you must remember for heaven's sake, never forget. I've highlighted it previously also in the Mundaka classes. I would like to highlight here today for a while. I may take it up during the next class also. That is, when we say that we have to make a back-breaking, total, complete, integrated effort to reach the goal. What is that goal? Mukti, liberation, freedom, emancipation. Now, and it is said to be Nitya Eternal. Once you are experienced that stage, you are eternally free. Nothing can be able to disturb you. What to speak of disturbing you will not be able to touch you. What to speak of touching you, it will not be able to reach you. You are far away from it. Now, you say it is eternal. It is infinite. It is immutable. It is absolute. That's what you say. Good enough. How can that eternal state of my being be created by something known as my effort. Whatever is created in point of time with a conglomeration of so many efforts, so many causes, disappears in time. That is an axiomatic truth. Whatever is created in time disappears, dissolves, disintegrates in time. Whether it's a millions of years or a granite rock or a firefly of six months life, they disappear. So how can you create the absolute? It cannot be created. Remember, for all times to come in your monastic or in your sadhu life, in your life of reaching the goal, your effort is directed towards cleaning up the dirty face of a mirror. You are not creating its innate quality, nature, reflectivity. The reflectivity is not being created. It is always there. What you are doing by your efforts is to remove the dirt to allow the reflectivity to blossom forth. You are trying to clean up the dirt of your heart so that it will be filled up with wine of God. You are 
emptying the heart of its dirty contents. You are emptying your personality of its dirty contents, which is a covering over the real fire. Once you clear it up, fire blossoms for An amber, if you shake the amber, the ashes fall off and you see crimson red fire. You don't create that crimson red fire. It is there always. It was the ash which was covering. So our effort known as sadhana creates to remove the obstacles in our path. It is self-effulgent, self-evident. It is sasam medya chaitanya. It is self-evident awareness. All you have done is you have created it. When we say karma yoga is an upaya, upaya for what? It qualifies us, makes us worthy of following the path of jnana yoga. And jnana ativa mukti, nothing but pure understanding that understanding not through the faculties, the understanding is through being and becoming and experiencing through akhanda akara chitta vritti udin. And all comprehensive vritti comes. I am that. So dear, the karma yoga for the purposes of our understanding, it is said to be a methodology, a procedure or a technique for Jnana Yoga. But in reality what happens, that is what Swamiji and Sri Ramakrishna had highlighted. In reality what has happened, it is instantaneous. There is no momentary gap between the two. Anavastha dosha doesn't happen. What is that anavastha dosha? If there is a gap of a moment, what is the reason it will not be two moments? Why not three moments? If it is one, why is it one? So there is no gap. You look at it from the success of karma yoga, you say it is karma yoga, you look at it from ajnana nivritti, absence of knowledge, you see it absence of That is moksha, that is mukti. That is why Swamiji has said in his preface to jnana yoga, jnana, karma, bhakti and raja yoga. They are all direct and independent means to realization. Nothing one after the other. That point is achieved by all goals. And when you reach that point, whatever Jnana tells you, Jatsankhai prapyate sthanam tadyogai rapigamyate is in the scriptures in the second chapter where Sankha leads you, yoga also leads you there. So don't think it is inferior. There's a, I would say, annoying impression that karma yoga is inferior to Gyanu Yoga. No. It is a direct and independent means to realization. Dears, let us stop here today. I'm not going to repeat to you to Karma Yoga. Next class, I start on the fourth chapter. Please kindly study this lesson before we start the Chaturtha Yoga, the fourth chapter, next discussion. Thank you, dears. Thank you ever so much. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti
हरि ओम तत्सत् श्री राम कृष्णार्पणमस्तु